Good evening. My name is Jeff Van Duzer. I'm the provost here at the university, and it's my very great privilege to, inter to welcome you uh, to the Winifred E. Wheater Annual Lecture. In just a couple of moments, uh, Dr. Didims will come and introduce our speaker for tonight. But I thought I would take just a few minutes to, for many of you, just remind you, but perhaps for some of you, acquaint you with Winifred Wheater. Uh, she was a faculty member here for 40 years uh, before she retired in 1975. Uh, and Dr. Wheater uh, talked mostly in classics. I, I called her Dr. Wheater, but I'm told that she actually preferred Miss Wheater. Uh, thinking that doctor, the prefix doctor, should only apply to people that had stethoscopes. But she did, in fact, earn her doctorate uh, at the University of Chicago in 1933, uh, and then came uh, in the midst of the Depression to Seattle Pacific and applied for a job. Uh, and she was given a professorship, not in classics. Uh, she was given a professorship in physical education, uh, <laughs> which she taught for 13 years. Uh, I think during that period, coached the women's basketball team and taught an occasional classics on the side. Uh, in the mid, uh, early to mid 40s, uh, she then uh, was able to shift over uh, and taught for the balance of her career here in the classics. She was, uh, as I said, she retired in 1975 and that was the first year that the Winifred Weider Lecture Series uh, was given. And I'm told uh, that uh, she would come to as many of these as she could uh, and after the person spoke, she would get up and reflect and comment on this for as long as she was able. Uh, I meant as many years as she was able, not for as <laughs> She uh, passed away in 2006 at the age of 96. This particular lectureship is uh, made possible by a very generous gift from the Professor Emeritus of Biology, Ross Shaw, and his wife, Barbara. Uh, for many, many years, they wanted their gift to remain anonymous, uh, but at Dr. Weider's passing, they were willing to let their uh, identities be known. The lectureship was uh, established by the Board of Trustees and is designed to provide a public platform from which the claims of the liberal arts in the Christian university may be espoused. Uh, if my math is right, this is the 39th annual Wheater Lecture, and as many of you in the room know, uh, this is really one of the high watermarks for the academic life of this community. So welcome. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Margaret Didims, who is the uh, director of our Center for Scholarship and Faculty Development, and she'll introduce our speaker for tonight. Thanks. Good evening. It's lovely to see a sellout crowd for a Weider lecture. Scholarship thrives here at SPU. Well, as the director of the Center for Scholarship and Faculty Development, it is one of my pleasures uh, to introduce this year's lecturer and recipient of the official title, the Winifred E. Weider Faculty Award for Meritorious Scholarship. Chair and Professor of Philosophy, Steve Lehman, is our uh, winner uh, this year. Steve Le Professor Lehman has been a member of the SPU community since 1986. He completed his undergraduate degree at Calvin College, his doctoral work at UCLA, and a postdoctoral fellowship at Notre Dame. His scholarship speaks to the very core of what we care about as Christians. Can we make a philosophical case for God? How does the moral order give credence to the existence of God? And can there be goodness in the absence of God? Professor Lehman is a much beloved professor, and tonight's audience attests to that, teaching Introduction to Philosophy, Introduction to Logic, Advanced Logic, Ethical Theory, Social Ethics, Philosophy of Religion, Philosophical Theology, Epistemology, and he is our lead teacher for UCOR 3000. In 1998, he received the SPU President's Citation for Excellence. Professor Lehman has also been a quiet yet talented servant to the SPU community. I first met Professor Lehman when he organized the first new faculty seminar back in 1994, a format which we have pretty much stuck to these 20 years in introducing new SPU faculty to the unique mission of Christian higher ed. He has been faculty chair, associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and more recently, co-chair of the Faculty Status Committee, as well as a member of the General Education Steering Committee. And he's on his second generation of advising, mentoring, and enriching the faith 
of our students. As the director of the center, I also got a sneak preview of the lecture tonight. And as I read through the draft, I found myself humming old hymns that have to do in some way with the blood of Jesus. Those of you who grew up with a hymnal do not have to think too deeply to come up with any number of hymns with lyrics that rhapsodize about Christ's blood. Let me just say a few lines for you. No need to hum along. There is a fountain filled with blood. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. What can wash my sins away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And of course, I have to end with a Charles Wesley. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hymnary.com, no lie, there is a website with that, lists over 3,000 hymns that contain the word blood. In these hymns, Jesus' blood does a lot of work. It covers, it cleanses, it saves, it seals, it heals, it strengthens, it frees, and it ransoms. In short, the folk wisdom contained in our hymnals gives us a glimpse of how generations of saints have understood the atonement. And does it matter if the atonement holds all these multiple meetings? Well, Professor Lehman is about to let us know. Philosophical reflections on the atonement. How do Christ's life, death, and resurrection put us right with God? Professor Lehman. I need to start with the thank yous. Uh, first, I want to thank the faculty status committee for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm honored that they put their trust in me. Hope this works out. Also, I want to thank Margaret Didims and Jan Pendergrass for organizing and promoting the, this lecture and for their prompt responses to the many questions I've had about the practicalities of this evening. Finally, I want to thank those who've read and commented on earlier drafts of my lecture or on my theory of the atonement. Owen Ewald, Sam Fullhart, Ken Hema, Doug Koskello, Jean Lemcho, Patrick McDonald, Rebecca Rice, Leland Saunders, Rick Steele, and Tom Chinna. Well, whatever the value of the lecture, I'm sure it'll be better because of their thoughtful comments. The New Testament teaches the doctrine of the atonement. It teaches that we are put right with God through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. In fact, the doctrine was preached before the New Testament was even written. But it raises challenging questions that Christian thinkers have struggled to answer. How could someone's death put us right with God? And how could Christ's horrible death in particular possibly uh, be needed for our salvation? Attempts to answer these and related questions are called theories of the atonement. Theories of the atonement, a theory of the atonement is an attempt to explain in clarifying detail how Christ's life, death, and resurrection put us right with God. Uh, by the way, you've got a hand out there. I hope you have access to it. The idea is, as the slides vanish, if you sort of forgot what was on it, you can hopefully look back and, and keep tracking along. There's a lot of propositions, I know, as we go along. So right away, there's a distinction between the doctrine, which I, uh, is there in the New Testament, and the various theories. And there's been many different theories. None of them are official Christian teaching. So I hope this is an area where we can, uh, are, we're still free to do some thinking, because I do intend to do that tonight. Some people think of the great Christian doctrines, incarnation, trinity, atonement, as mysteries. And I want to say a word about that at the outset, because maybe that means I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Then uh, what are some of the main theories of the atonement that have been on offered in Christian history. I want to uh, summarize a few of them. Then I want to offer three criteria for evaluating theories of the atonement. The first of those criteria will be fit with scripture. And so I need to say something about what I see in the scripture. That'll have to be brief. And I'm not a Bible scholar, but still I've got to tell you what I think is there. Then I want to very briefly evaluate some of the historically influential theories. Also discuss 
uh, contemporary theory offered by Richard Swinburne, the British philosopher of religion, and finally offer a proposal of my own. All right, how about the idea that the doctrine of the atonement is supposed to be a mystery? Well, I have two questions basically there. First, what does that mean? Does it just mean we can't expect to fully explain it? If that's what it means, I'm good with that statement. I never have anything but partial explanations in philosophy anyway, so if I can do that, I'd be happy. On the other hand, if it means it can't be explained even in part, I guess I'm just not sure why we should accept that. I, would, I don't know a, a solid argument for that position. Sometimes the appeal to mystery is used, it seems to me, to end a conversation. I don't know if you're inclined to do that, but I hope you'll be, at least be willing to track along with me tonight. My opinion is this. We can't say in advance what we can understand. We just have to give it a whirl and uh, see what we come up with. And so I hope you'll play along with me to that extent tonight. Okay, so what are some of the main historically influential theories of the atonement? Bearing in mind, uh, these do not appear in the Bible, uh, nor are they part of any of the great creeds, such as the Nicene Creed. For the first couple hundred years of the Christian era, uh, there wasn't much theorizing about the atonement. Christian thinkers were content to quote scripture and use scriptural analogies. But gradually there was a felt need for more by way of explanation. And the first theory to emerge was the ransom theory. Origen offered a version of it, Gregory of Nyssa. Augustine had a version of it too. Uh, the idea here is that we have become captives to the devil, uh, as if we were in a war, and in ancient times, a captive in a war could be purchased through a ransom, all right? So in order to get us out of bondage or captivity to the devil, God will have to pay the devil a ransom to free us. What will it be? He offers the death of Christ, attracted to Satan, to extend the reign of death to a sinless person. So the devil was given his due, and we humans were freed, according to this theory. Unfortunately for the devil, he didn't realize that Christ could be resurrected, and he lost out on the ransom in the end anyway. Uh, one of the great books on the history of this doctrine is by L.W. Grenstead, Short History of the Doctrine of the Atonement. And to me, this is a fascinating comment he makes. I thank Steve Parashow for putting me onto this book, by the way. I see him sitting right here. Theories of the atonement, based upon the idea of a transaction between God and the devil, stood for 900 years as the ordinary exposition of the fact of the atonement. So if I understand that, for roughly the first half of Christian history, had you asked a question here, and had you gotten an answer, it would likely have been in terms of a transaction between God and the devil, not, I think, the usual answer we're given today. Anselm rejected the ransom theory. I'll get to his reasons why a little bit later. But he not only rejected the ransom theory, but pro provided another theory which became very influential, his satisfaction theory. His idea is that we owe God a life of perfect obedience. But, of course, we haven't uh, come through on that. You know, because of our sin, we, owe, we are in debt to God. And God can't simply forgive the debt. God's honor and justice require that that debt be paid, or if it's not paid, that we be punished. We can't pay the debt. The sins are back there. We can't fix that situation. The good news for us is that Christ did pay the debt. He paid it by living a, a life perfectly obedient to the Father, even to the point of dying on the cross. And for, for Christ, dying is beyond the call of duty. As a sinless person, he uh, goes beyond the call of duty in dying. Please notice about this theory. It doesn't say that Christ was punished. It says he paid the debt. Okay, that's, that's a very important feature of this theory. It's not a punishment. Also in the Middle Ages, Abelard put forward a theory which has been very influential, his moral influence theory. On this theory, Christ reconciles us to God simply through the kind of life he lived a life that provides an inspirational example of holy love. Of 
course, Christian thinkers had always emphasized that Christ was a good example. The novelty here is to make that the, the center piece of the theory of atonement. The punishment theory. Uh, about this, L.W. Grinstead says, uh, before the Reformation, only a few hints of the punishment theory can be found. After the Reformation, it becomes common among Protestant writers. On this theory, justice requires that wrongdoers be punished. And we are sinners, wrongdoers. In fact, because we've offended God, who's infinite, we deserve infinite, that is, everlasting suffering. So we're in a really desperate situation on this view. But through his death on the cross, Christ took the punishment that we deserve. So there we have explicitly the idea that uh, Christ takes the punishment for our sins. He gets what we deserve. All right, well, there are some of the main historically influential theories. How are we to evaluate theories of the atonement? I suggest three criteria. First, of course, do they fit with the scriptures? That's got to be there. But secondly, for any theory, we have to ask, does it explain how Christ's life, death, and resurrection reconcile us to God? And I think we'll see that some of the theories struggle when we ask that question. Finally, theories of the atonement make moral assumptions. They as make assumptions about God's love or God's justice, sometimes even further assumptions about the moral life. And we have to ask, are those assumptions ones that we can buy into? Okay, so fit with scriptures. Well, what do the scriptures say? Now, I'm not a Bible scholar, and I, in any case, don't have a lot of time here. I'm just going to say that I think we can classify the relevant scriptures in three main categories. First, some statements about the atonement are just very general. They don't give us specifics, but they clearly declare the doctrine. I think the most famous is probably this passage from 2 Corinthians. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Some of the theories of the atonement seem to put the whole focus on Christ's death, but it seems to me if we read the scriptures, we see that Christ's atoning work is not just about his death, it's also about his life and about his resurrection. So take this passage from Romans 5. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we, will we be saved by his life? And again in Romans, Jesus was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification, raised to put us right with God. And in 1 Corinthians, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So it seems to me that scriptures are saying that it's Christ's life, death, and resurrection. All of that is part of the work of the atonement. So again, when we look at a theory, we need to ask, does it allow does it give a proper role to all, of all three of those aspects of Christ's work? In the New Testament, two analogies are given again and again uh, about the atonement, the sacrifice and ransom analogies. At the Last Supper, Christ himself seems to allude to the practice of Old Testament, uh, Old Testament practice of animal sacrifice when he says, this is my blood which is poured out for many. The whole book of Hebrews in the New Testament is a development of that sacrifice analogy. He entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. A couple comments here. Sometimes it's, a, it's assumed that when an animal was sacrificed, it was punished for the sins of humans. But as far as I can tell, the Old Testament never says that, nor, nor does the New Testament. 
the Bible, uh, the Old Testament says a lot about how to do a sacrifice, but it doesn't seem to me that it says much about how they're supposed to work. We're just kind of left in the dark about that. The other uh, main analogy is the ransom analogy. It appears in many places. I list some of them here. I'll just read one. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I think these two an analogies are basically making the same point. In the Old Testament, wealth was in livestock. So you bring the goat or the calf to sacrifice. You're bringing your wealth, something of value, and sacrificing it for the sake of maintaining a relationship with God. In, the, in a ransom, similarly, there's a captive you want to set free. You've got to bring something of value to free that captive. So I think both of these analogies are making the point that you can't deal with sin cheaply. Something of value, and of course, ultimately, it's going to be of great value, has to be offered to deal with it. Do the scriptures teach that Christ was punished? Well, of course, many people have uh, interpreted the Bible that way. And there's a big story here, and again, I'm not a Bible scholar, so all I can do is sort of say, well, here's my, the opinion I've come to having you know, tried to read up on this. I, I think it's a stretch to get it out of the New Testament anyway. Here's a passage that many have interpreted along that line. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. About that passage, N.T. Wright comments, this is the closest Paul comes to saying what so many of his interpreters have attributed to him, that the death of Jesus was the ultimate moment of judicial condemnation of God's punishment. I'll just point out that it doesn't say Christ was punished. It says that God condemned sin. That is, he declared sin wrong and reprehensible. That seems to me to be a different idea than the idea of punishment. Now, in Isaiah 53, we definitely have chastisement. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. So it's there. I would only caution whether there's a clear support here for a punishment theory of the atonement. Is the chastisement here a figure of speech? If it's more than that, if it is referring to punishment in some way, remember punishment can have different purposes. Punishment can be, as it usually is by parents, for instruction, for correction. Or, of course, it can be for retribution. That's the idea that's needed for the punishment theory. All I'm saying is, I think, uh, that we don't have a clear endorsement here of any one theory of the, of the uh, atonement. Okay, evaluation of these historical theories. Now, maybe it's going to look like a hatchet job here because I don't have much time. And rather than try to go through all the things that I see that are strengths of these theories, and then, you know, I'm not, not going to do that. I'm going to try to go to the heart of it and say, here's the question about the theory that leaves me wanting to find another, another way of thinking about it. And of course, you may not share my opinion about that. That's great. That's what the question and answer time is for. Anselm rejected the ransom theory because he says, look, Origen, you're, you're assuming that uh, the devil has a right to be paid a ransom. And you're assuming that God is required to get in there and do this transaction with the devil. Uh, but remember, the, the, the devil is just an outlaw. He, he's like a kidnapper. He grabs somebody and then he, de he demands a rat ransom, not because he has a right to it, just because he wants it. And so for uh, Anselm, it's the moral underpinnings of this theory that are questionable. It's assuming the devil has rights that the devil doesn't have and that God has, uh, is required to enter into this transaction. No, God doesn't have to do that. Even further, it does seem to me to be implausible to suppose that God somehow owes it to the devil to let the devil kill God's son. That's just kind of hard for me to believe. The moral influence theory. Well, suppose I am inspired by Christ's example. I hope so. 
but how exactly would that put me right with God? My past sins are still back there. What does, it, what does uh, some improvement on my part do about that? How does it make me right with God? Furthermore, what about the fact that I'm going to remain imperfect, or at least I am, uh, you know, you know speak, 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 speak for yourself about that. But I think for many of us, uh, some sin is going to remain, and what does this theory say about that? It just doesn't seem to say anything. So it's the explanatory power here. It doesn't seem to be really show how are we getting right with God uh, on this theory. And then secondly, what role does the resurrection play here? It's Christ's earthly life that is our example uh, on this theory the, that's to inspire us. The only role the resurrection can play is it can show God's approval of the atoning work already done. And I think we'll see this is a common way that the theories of atonement try to fit the resurrection in. It comes in what I think of as a kind of secondary role, signaling that what Christ has already done has God's approval. I would like to see a theory that puts the resurrection more in the center of the work of the atonement. Punishment theory. Well, an obvious and probably the main uh, difficulty stated for the theory is how can, the, how can punishing an innocent person satisfy the demands of justice? Let's just think of a modern courtroom. Someone is found guilty of murder. The death penalty is, is, uh, is given, or not, not given, but is the sentence there. Uh, and a family member says, well, we feel terrible, you know, about what this uh, person has done in our family, but uh, I volunteer to die in his place. Can the judge say, well, I really don't care who dies as long as somebody does, so step up. It seems to me well, that would be a miscarriage of, judge, of, of uh, justice. There's also uh, uh, the question, is the kind of harsh treatment Christ received even properly described as a punishment? And of course that raises the question, well, what's punishment? Uh, well, philosophers have uh, produced an analysis of that that's uh, fairly standard at this point. Punishment involves harsh treatment. That could be imprisonment, whipping, the death penalty. It has to be imposed intentionally by legitimate authority. Freelance work here is, does not count as punishment. Uh, uh, of course, in, in, the, in the case we're discussing, the legitimate authority would be God. Now remember, it's God's justice, so ultimately this punishment is imposed by God, if that's the way the, the uh, uh, punishment theory, or if, if, if it is punishment, it would be imposed by God, ultimately. It has to be for a violation of rules authorized by that legitimate authority. But crucially, it's got to be of an offender for an offense, or at least of a supposed offense. Now, the criminal justice system makes mistakes. So sometimes people get punished for things they didn't really do, but they have to at least be supposed to have done it. Um, suppose the, the state puts uh, someone in, in prison for their political opinions, knowing full well they've not done any, violated any law. Is that punishment? Well, by this analysis, no, it's an abuse of power. It's a terrible thing. It simply does not uh, rise to the level of punishment. Punishment here is an attempt, at least, at justice. Lastly, how would Christ's life come and resurrection come into the picture on the punishment view? His life, in general, was not punishment. The resurrection clearly was not punishment. The resurrection can play only the role, again, of signaling God's approval of the work already done. Now, I skipped over Anselm's view, partly for time constraints, but also because, as I see it, Richard Swinburne's contemporary view is in the spirit of Anselm. So hopefully uh, what I say about uh, Swinburne would apply uh, with maybe so few changes to Anselm's view. Swinburne begins by looking at our ordinary moral lives. What happens when you wrong someone? What should you do? He says you should atone. What does that mean? It means you should repent, be sorrowful for what you've done. You should apologize. 
you should make reparation and offer penance, in, at least in the case of serious wrongdoings. I don't suppose I've stolen a car. I should be sorry about that. I should apologize. I should give the car back. Uh, but I should not only give it back, I've seriously inconvenienced the person, possibly traumatized them. I'm going to have to go beyond that in reparation to compensate. But then Swinburne says, and you've got to do something else. You need to do something further to show how sorry you really are. And that's the penance, according to Swinburne. Well, we humans have seriously wronged God. We've wronged God by not worshiping God properly. We've wronged God also by mistreating God's creatures. We are definitely, uh, we definitely have wronged God. And we have no way to make reparation. Even if we were to live perfectly from now on, our sinful past would remain what it is. Now, as in Anselm's view, Christ lives the perfect life, and this plays the key role for Swinburne. And the uh, next quotation I read is really, I think, the centerpiece of his theory. Swinburne says, it is up to the wrong person, God in this case, to deem when a sufficient reparation has been made. And one truly perfect life would surely be a proper amount of reparation for God to deem that reparation enough had been done. So in other words, God's the wrong party. God gets to decide what the reparation will be. God has decided, according to Swinburne, to accept Christ, a perfect life as the reparation. And all we really need to do then is to accept, accept God's generous provision and to plead it as reparation and penance. Now I'm going to raise three questions about Swinburne's view. I think I know how he'd reply. Uh, and I think his reply is contained in the quotation I've already read, but I'm questioning that, all right, whether that really works. I assume that our creator expects each of us to live a life well. We weren't put here in order to uh, just live a disastrous life and to fail on all counts or anything like that. We're meant to make the best we can of the gifts we've been given. If that's so, does it make sense for God to accept someone else's life as reparation? I want to give an analogy. I'm taking a course, and mm, a term paper has been required. And I really don't want to do the term paper, so I wait around until 10 minutes before it's due. I scribble down a few thoughts on a piece of paper, turn it in, and mm, I fail. All right, now, how are we going to fix this situation? Well, could we fix it like this? I go to a fellow student and get their consent to turn in get the consent of that student to turn in his paper, all right? I go to the teacher and ask, would it be okay if I turned his paper in in my place? And she says, okay. Now, is that a satisfactory resolution of the problem? It seems to me, no, it's not. It, it's, it, doesn't, it just doesn't fix uh, what was wrong with that situation. In the same way, I don't see why God, I don't see how it makes sense for God to say, okay, Christ lived a perfect life, I'll just take that as my reparation. It's even worse, it seems to me, because Christ is the wronged party. Christ is divine. And so he would be making reparation to himself. Now that would be like the teacher saying, bad paper, but you know what? I'll accept one of my own. And, 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 <clears throat> finally, finally, uh, Given that a perfect life is what's needed, how do the crucifixion and resurrection come into the picture? Now, Swinburne's very explicit about the resurrection. It comes in exactly as I've mentioned before in other theories. It signals God's approval of what Christ has already done. Once again, I just don't find that a central enough role. Others have pointed out a perfect life doesn't have to end in a horrible death. It doesn't have to end in the crucifixion. So if it's all about the perfect life, we don't really, the, the crucifixion actually seems to be dispensable on this theory. All right, well, I've taken my shots at others, and so now I'm sticking my neck out, and I'm sure you'll let me know if, it, if I've uh, only fallen into even worse errors, perhaps. In a sentence, what I want to now try to argue is that Christ's life, death, and resurrection are a fitting and effective way of removing 
what I call the sin barrier, a technical term for my purposes. What's the sin barrier? And again, the handout is going to be helpful, I think, hopefully here in, in tracking along. The sin barrier are, is a set of factors that separates us from God, that alienates us from God. Of course, our sins are on that list. But as I see it, too often when we're thinking about the atonement, we focus on the misdeeds of individuals. And there's what I would call the culture of sin operative in the world that is alienating or separating us from God. And it consists of a series of fears and uh, feelings. How are they passed along? Sort of like, as I see it, uh, sexism and racism. We just find that they come over. It's like a contagion or something. We've got these things, but they interfere with trust in God. So, for example, our fear that good will not triumph over evil. If we've got that fear, I guess we don't think God's going to come through, right? There's, a, there's a, a lack of trust there in God. Resentment at the suffering and danger we must endure in this earthly life. And who's in charge? Who's letting that happen? Our fear of feeling that our lives are insignificant. And who put us here? Who gave us this kind of life? And more explicitly, our fear that God is indifferent to us, or even maybe worse, out to get us, or at least unwilling to help us. Easy to despair over our persisting spiritual failures, and I, for some of us, terror of death and judgment. Now, I don't, I'm not suggesting that all of us have all of these fears and feelings, but I think they're common enough, uh, commonly enough represented in human life. I'm also not saying uh, that we are always at fault for having those fears and feelings. They come over us from where? I don't know. You know, we, we pick them up. But I'm just saying they do play the role of separating us from God because they interfere with trusting in God. Some of the theories of the atonement seem to be entirely focused on what's got to happen in order for God to forgive us in the sense simply of not holding a sin against us. That's what they are entirely about. Now I think that can, you can easily suppose that's right if you're reading English translations of the Bible. But the Greek word "opposis" can have a richer meaning and I think it does in this context. It can even mean release from captivity. So as I see it, atonement isn't simply about how can God forgive us in the sense of not only a grudge against us anymore, but how can God release us from the captivity to this thing I've called the sin barrier, this complex of fears and feelings? Well, what I want to suggest is that the life, death, and resurrection of Christ have a clear bearing on the elements of the sin barrier, on all of the elements. And one of the main uh, ways they have a bearing is they remove the grounds for the fears and feelings that I've listed, items three through 10 there, if you have your, your list of the items on, on the sin barrier. I'm just gonna go through there now, one by one, or well, at least through them all eventually, and try to say what, what I mean by that. What about our fear that good will not triumph over evil? Well, Christ is God incarnate. So in Christ's life, we see God in action in the world. And he clearly opposes evil. He opposes it in every way throughout his life. He's going up against the demons and exorcisms. He's, of course, dealing with sin constantly, confronting injustice and cruelty. God is opposed to evil. We're assured of that through Christ's life. Furthermore, through the resurrection, we can be assured that God is willing and able to overcome even death, which I take it is some of the greatest ammo in the arsenal of evil. So we can trust that in the long run, God is going to triumph over evil. What about our resentment about suffering and danger? You know, we're talking about the problem of evil here. Well, a divine person has freely consented to live an earthly life, to share in the kind of suffering that we have to share in. The hardships, and of course, in the kind of death Christ lived, well, I hope most of us will never have to face anything like that. He took on 
extreme suffering, I don't think he would do that unless there was a good reason to live the kind of life we are living, a life that can definitely involve uh, suffering and danger. We may not be able to state a theodicy, but it seems to me that Christ's willingness to come to earth and live an earthly life indicates, in effect, there is one, that there is a reason why we live a life that exposes us to suffering and danger. So it seems to me that through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, the grounds for item four are removed. Now, when I say the grounds are removed, I don't mean that somehow magically, because Christ came, nobody has these fears and feelings anymore. They obviously have these fears and feelings, okay? But if the grounds are removed, then we have the basis on which we can begin to replace those fears and feelings with attitudes of trust in God. Of course, that's going to take the spiritual disciplines. The Holy Spirit has a role to play here too, okay? But I'm saying that Christ has made a kind of major assault on this sin barrier. Our fear that human life is meaningless or insignificant? Well, once again, Christ has consented to live this kind of life. A divine being would not consent to live a meaningless or insignificant life. Further, through Christ's teaching, he points to where the meaning comes from. In a nutshell, through loving God and neighbor. There's a much bigger story there, but I'm sure you've heard much of it. So Christ's life removes the grounds for item five, I would claim. How about the fear that God is indifferent, out to get us, or unwilling to help us? And those, that, that could easily include the fear that God will not forgive us, which of course is alive and well in the world. But if Jesus was God incarnate, then it seems to me clear that God is not indifferent or hostile to us. At great cost, cost of coming to earth, living the hardship life, the life of hardship, and then uh, even dying on the cross, God's love has been extended to us. Lastly, the dread of death and judgment. Well, actually, not last. I've got to say something about the, the first two items also. Well, first, Christ's resurrection indicates that death is not the end. This, we're in one phase of our existence, but there's more to it. Maybe more importantly here, Christ is divine, again, as well as human, and so he, his life gives us a picture of divine love. And that picture indicates, it seems to me, we're not going to be judged by a God who's obsessed with retribution, but by a God whose love is like the love made manifest in Christ. That, it seems to me, properly removes terror about death and, ju and judgment. Not, of course, that we're going to be happy about these things, but we need not face them in uh, you know, abject terror. Now, sins, period. What about them? Well, I think that the place to begin here is with Christ's life. What did his life consist in? Largely, uh, he was a healer and a teacher. What did he teach? Well, you may have noticed that he has a tremendous stress on God's readiness to forgive in his teaching. So we have the wonderful parable of the prodigal son, and we have the parable of the unmerciful servant. In some theories of the atonement, the assumption seems to be that it's really tough for God to forgive. He almost hardly doesn't want, quite want to do it, you know. That doesn't seem to me to be the teaching of Christ. The teaching of Christ is that God stands ready to forgive. Moreover, he didn't just teach it. He's God incarnate. He demonstrated it. So the paralytic is lowered through the roof, and the first words to him are, Son, your sins are forgiven. A Pharisee calls a a woman, a sinner, and Christ just turns to her and says, your sins are forgiven. He just does it, right, you know, right there in front of people. Shows them how divine forgiveness works. God is ready to forgive. And given that Christ was willing to be crucified to break down this sin barrier, uh, surely we, are, we can be confident that the offer of forgiveness is genuine. All right.
questions are ready because it's almost over. Someone might say at this point, well, why didn't God just tell us he loves us and wouldn't that just uh, deal with this sin barrier? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think so. I think there's uh, in human life a big difference between just talking and fully entering into a situation. And here's my little humble parable for that. Okay, so picture some children playing in a sandbox. And uh, there's an adult standing at the outside, a man, let's say, in a business suit. And let's, he's not a stranger. He's an uncle of one of the children or something. And he's trying to talk with them. Good job. Nice little castle you made there. Whatever. And the kids are pretty much ignoring him because he's not involved, right? He's just talking. Someone else comes along, let's say an aunt of one of the children, old clothes on, she climbs right into the sandbox, begins playing with them, and soon they're interacting, laughing, having a good time. Okay, it's a, not a classic parable, but, <laughs> but the it's meant to just say there's such a big difference between entering fully into a situation and just talking. And it seems to me that Christ in fully living an earthly life with all the hardships the encounters with evil and injustice and the horrible death on the cross uh, shows that willingness to fully enter into our situation. The actions speak louder than words. And in brief then, uh, Christ has triumphed over the sin bearer. That's my suggestion. Yeah, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more perhaps on how uh, Christ's death fits into it. It seems like uh, the resurrection does a lot in terms of the redemptive aspect and the life does a lot as well. Uh, but the death mostly in, in how you presented it seemed to serve as to show God's seriousness and did not have as much redemptive quality in and of itself. Okay. Well, uh, maybe we can get at that by using a hypothetical. Suppose Christ had come and lived a life on the Riviera and uh, basically a, a, a life enjoying himself, and it, it wouldn't work, right? There would not be that identity with, uh, with the serious kinds of suffering that's involved in this life. So I think unless Christ gets involved in serious suffering, many people are going to look at this life of his and say, I don't see how that speaks to me, how that assures me that the kind of life I have to face is meaningful, or, uh, yeah, and, and so on. Yeah. So. Yes. Kathleen? Hey, this, this was really interesting, but have we moved, in your view, from an atonement to an incredibly intrusive therapist? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, atonement means at one minute, right? It means whatever it takes to reconcile us to God. And of course, my, my thought is that if the sin barrier is, if the, if the underpinnings of the sin barrier have been destroyed by Christ's life, death, and resurrection, then at, at one that is now possible. Of course, we have to do something too. We have to repent of our sins. But, but the uh, work of dismantling or undermining the sin barrier has been done by Christ. That didn't connect, I take it. Okay, all right, thank okay. you. Jeff. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I just, uh, I'm not sure that I, I, obviously I haven't thought this quite through, but it strikes me that, that what this deals with is for the most part, except for maybe number one and two in particular, and for death at the end, is a largely subjective, uh, it deals with a subjective sense of, what, what, would it, what, what does it offer someone who feels none of these things, uh, except for maybe, you know, we've been obviously all through the day, but thinking of maybe, I don't know if I have a good example in mind, but if you know, Christopher Hitchens feel most of these things, I mean, it would be put right uh, for most of these things, or uh, that maybe 
he gave him a, he gave him, may not be the best example. But I'm just well, Christopher Hitchens wouldn't feel these things because he doesn't even think there's a God. Uh, so he wouldn't be resentful of God for, for allowing the evil in the world. Uh, there's no God to be resentful towards. Well, I, I'm assuming that the whole theory here is about reconciliation with God. So I, uh, if a person has no concern about how to be reconciled to God, I, I don't see how I can, I can speak to that person. I guess I'll have to discuss their atheism with them first. Steve is a Presbyterian. I wanted to ask a Methodist question. Um, <laughs> um, in what way is, because much of what you know, I'm hearing is bound up in your, your understanding of justification, how does sanctification possibly come into the picture here? And kind of the, the way in which um, you know, Wesley, in particular, would see those two as, as such a part, not necessarily of atonement theology, but just more, more of a general sense of how justification and sanctification relate to each other. Is there an implicit sanctification? Um, part of this of your, of, uh, that comes next? It's doubtful I can answer that question, but I, 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 can, I can say this much. Uh, again, that Christ has uh, removed the underpinnings, the grounds for these fears and feelings, doesn't mean they automatically go away. In fact, they don't. Uh, and, and that's where I would see the, the spiritual for disciplines need very much to be applied. If we are uh, to move from a head belief in what Christ did into, into having that actually filter down to our emotions so that we actually have attitudes of trust. Uh, that, that's, uh, that takes a lot of hard work and, uh, from what I can tell in my own experience anyway. I certainly don't pretend to be there. Steve, um, thank you very much for these philosophical reflections which sound very much like theological reflections. And I know there's not a hard and fast barrier, but how, how is it that philosophy helps us to get at this in a way that theology alone might not? Oh, uh, I, you know, I, the tr simple truth is I don't draw that boundary. Um, I just wanted to try to answer a question. How can I understand how Christ's life, death, and resurrection has somehow reconciled us, or at least made possible a reconciliation? And when I think about it, I, I, try, I first make a list of, well, what is it, what's the problem here? What's the, what's the barrier? And, and I started to realize, well, yeah, my sins, but it's a lot more than that because there's all, this, there's all these negative thoughts and feelings and fears that are, in fact, actually alienating me. And then I just wanted to try to uh, try to think about well, what what does Christ's life say about those things? And it seems to me it it tells us really it would make more sense to trust God instead of having those fears and feelings. So I don't know the how certainly, and I appreciate that um, the resurrection as a sign of success and, and a sign of approval. Um, when I think of um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, have no other gods before me, and love your neighbor as yourselves, the death on the cross seems to exemplify that like nothing else. And the resurrection then, I don't understand how the how would be, but that it would represent a, a sign of that success, perhaps. A success at, at loving God? or At having um, demonstrated love for God, having no other gods before him besides the love for God, and to pay the price, if you would, for his neighbor. I, I'm not quite sure if I have your question yet. Is it about exactly what the resurrection, the role of the resurrection? Or? I apologize. It's not a question. You're right. I apologize. Um, Christ said there are, there, are two, there, are, there, are two, there are two great commandments. The great commandment was love of God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And the second was to love your neighbor as yourself. So if um, uh, there was a punishment element that we were all to pay and somehow his death could satisfy uh, that payment, wouldn't it then seem that he has met those two great commandments 
in one event. Well, certainly on the punishment view, Christ is showing his love for us by taking on this terrible punishment that we deserve. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I mean, I'll say for the punishment theory, it very, if the question is why the horrible death, I think it answers that. Uh, there's this, a lot of punishment is deserved. So it's gonna be a horrible punishment. Could we think possibly of your view of this Tumman theory as um, being a three-part wrecking ball of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and kind of taking down that sin barrier wall? Or do you think that's too simplified? No, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful summary. As I understood, the, your particular theory of atonement, it's Christ's life specifically and the resurrection and death on the cross that removes the sin barrier. I'm curious if you could comment on the existence of the sin barrier before Christ's life and ministry and death and resurrection. Well, it was there. Um, uh, maybe, the, maybe the question in a way is, why didn't God do this a lot sooner if, if there was a need for this kind of action? Is that, okay, I was afraid that was it. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think the general story there in Christian theology has been that there needed to be preparation before Christ's work could be even understood in context. And of course, the, the Old Testament is all about that preparation period. Um, this is a question, I, it, I, I think it's related. Uh, because I know with atonement we're talking about relationships between human beings and God, but I'm wondering about the redemption of creation, the, uh, how Christ's life, death, and resurrection serves to redeem creation of its groaning and to uh, free it as well. How is creation um, <laughs> reconciled to God? I have to admit, I haven't gotten there yet. If, if anything I've said extends to that question, I, uh, I don't, don't see it yet. I mean, maybe the resurrection is a kind of promise that there is a, you know, that is a maybe the, well, it's the, he's the firstborn of creation, right? The, the first race. So maybe that's the promise that there's more to come. But I, oh, Susan, it's a great question. I, I really have to admit I don't know the answer to that at all, or, or even have any plausible comment. <laughs> Any other neo-Orthodox uh, security questions to ask you? <laughs> <laughs>